Hello and welcome to the Disruptive Innovation Festival 2017, where we asked the question, what if we could redesign everything? I'm Harry and this is Suki. And today we'll be looking at the future of the built environment. And in particular, we'll be uh, looking at what a living building is all about. And joining us today for this uh, session, we have Amanda Sturgeon, Chief Executive of the International Living Future Institute and integrative designer, Matthew Van Sweden. Uh, but first of all, we'd like to let our guests tell us a little bit more uh, about, about this um, concept of the living building. So Amanda, shall we start with you? Well, hi. Uh, we, we couldn't quite hear the introduction there, but um... Hi, I'm Amanda Sturgeon. Is it is it time, Colin, for me to? Yep. Sorry, Amanda. Yep. Sorry. I just yeah. uh, <laughs> passing it over to you to tell us a little bit more about um, the Living Future Institute. Okay, great. Happy to. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'm Amanda. I'm the CEO of the International Living Future Institute. We are the home organisation of the Living Building Challenge, as well as some other uh, programs. Um, So uh, just showing here on a slide that uh, we're best known for the Living Building Challenge program, and that's what we're going to focus in on today. But we also have other programs focused on communities and products, social justice and zero energy. Um, the focus of the Institute is to really uh, create transformative change in the built environment and to be somewhat disruptive. Um, we, we're looking to really recreate what we think of as a living future and how our built environment plays a pretty key role in uh, transforming us to think differently beyond what, how we may build currently and towards um, thinking quite differently about our structures and, and how they behave for us. So our mission as an institute is to uh, lead the transformation of communities that are socially just, culturally rich, and ecologically restorative. So our focus is not just on uh, ecological solutions, but also on social and cultural solutions as well. And, uh, you know, one inspiration for our work is the work of Buckminster Fuller. And the quote uh, that he has really sums up the work that we do here at the Institute, uh, make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. And that really informs the sort of three-pronged mission that we have at the Institute and how we see our work. So the Living Building Challenge for us is not just a means to an end. It's not just about certifying projects and uh, thinking that we've done a great job. It's actually really about transforming how we think about our built environment. And the, the biggest um, step we can make, first of all, is we've been you know, bringing in some sustainable green initiatives into our buildings, making them a little bit better. But really the core of our work is um, having people ask themselves the question, what does good look like? If you were to really design something that was good, what would that look like? And I think most people would say it probably doesn't look like the way we're building today. We're on the third version of the Living Building Challenge. Um, it's a challenge. Uh, it's really tough. We ask for buildings to be zero net energy, zero water, remove toxins from the materials in the project, um, think about social equity, health, as well as beauty. And I know Matthew's going to talk a little bit more about a project that's used the program that'll illustrate it. But uh, right now we have over 400 projects. The slide's already a few days out of date. Uh, we have projects in um, many different countries around the world. Um, and uh, mostly, you know, in North America, we're housed in Seattle. And so we have a sort of grouping of projects in the Pacific Northwest going down the West Coast. But since then, it's spread out across the country into Canada, Latin America, through Europe and into Australia and Asia. A little sampling of some of our projects here. Uh, these are all certified projects with us or just about to be um, a couple on the verge. Um, and a real range of projects. We started out by having projects that were kind of environmental learning centers, small projects that could be off the grid and achieve this pretty easily. And then after a few years expanded to, uh, you know, commercial office buildings like the Bullet Center, that's where I'm housed um, in Seattle, uh, offices in Shanghai, um, 
research center in Australia, um, all kinds of different projects, including one for Google Chicago. One of my favorite projects is, uh, is in New Zealand. It's a cultural center for the Tuhoi Maori. And they discovered the Living Building Challenge is an opportunity to have a framework for building really a sense of hope uh, in their community. They got a settlement from the New Zealand government and they were able to um, build a cultural center that could really be a beacon for uh, cultural repair for their community, many of whom were unemployed and pretty desperate. I think this is a great example of how the Living Building Challenge can actually bring a community together to really rethink um, who we are as people and how we connect with our place. I have a new book, Creating Biophilic Buildings, which came out a few days ago. Um, just wanted to mention that about 14 of these projects are featured in here, uh, different projects from around the world that look at how we use nature to inspire um, the relationship that we have with nature and the buildings that we create as a result. So that's a little introduction to who we are with some sample projects. Um, happy to talk more about it after we hear from Matthew. Well, thank you, Amanda. It was really Welcome. inspirational to hear, especially, especially to know that there are around 400 of these projects around the world. Um, also really great to hear how buildings are being constructed to be regenerative and self-sufficient <coughs> while still having a positive impact on humans and, and natural systems. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to now introduce Matthew van Sweden. Matthew has facilitated uh, the design of Michigan's first registered commercial living building challenge project. It is a tribal college for the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe. So Matthew, tell us more about this project. Great, thanks for the introduction, uh, Suki. As I said, my name is Matthew Van Sweet. I'm a designer here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I work at uh, a firm called Catalyst Partners and uh, we kind of design a spaces where all species can flourish and it's kind of evident in the project. Um, I hope to share a little bit more about um, Catalyst Partners itself is a, a kind of a um, group of experts in high performance and restorative design and we kind of have built um, the tools and, and staff necessary to kind of deliver these sorts of, of projects into the future. Um, kind of in full disclosure though, I'm a, I'm a recent transfer. I, I only was uh, hired at Catalyst a few months ago um, and the project that I'll be working talking about um, came out of my work at Integrated Architecture where I was a director of sustainability. And uh, Integrated itself is a full service architectural engineering firm out of Grand Rapids um, with a speciality in sustainable and restorative design. So the project, as was mentioned, um, was for the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe um, in, in the tribal college that I had. Um, as you can see from this slide, has a, has a long history of looking for um, the right process to, to deliver a new facility. And so um, they looked at other rating systems that were out on the market and their building committee kind of explored We they explored surf, they explored green globes. Um, and none of them really fit uh, what their cultural heritage, um, what the values are as a, as a tribe. And when they went to the kind of architectural market, they had this goal of net zero, um, of a net zero building. And, and that's the RP that they put on the market. And that's what we at Integrated responded to. And part of that work that we responded to was uh, hosting a, a workshop on how to deliver and how to design to net zero. Um, and honestly, I achieved a little bit. Instead of hosting a, a whole day charrette, I actually invited them to a workshop um, that the Living Building Challenge put on, or the International Living Future put on regarding the Living Building Challenge. Um, and my hope was that they, as an organization, um, would fall in love with the Living Building Challenge that I had. Um, and sure enough, they did. And quickly uh, after that, that day, kind of exploring the Living Building Challenge, what it means, they tasked me to put together a team. And, you know, I had a brief experience with the challenge, and I knew that integrated architecture, um, as talented as we are, we weren't the experts in all the, the kind of spaces that we need to kind of think about. Um, and so the, the typical design bid build process kind of goes, you, a client has, has a need for a building, they hire an architect. Um, an architect goes through a kind of pre-construction or uh, semantic design phase to kind of put together a concept of what that building might look like. Um, and before 1% uh, of the building's kind of design resources are spent, 
about 70% of its life cycle costs are already committed. So the Living Building Challenge really forced us to rethink this delivery method. And so we kind of built together a larger team, um, kind of addressing all the impairments that we could identify. Um, and we, you know, we hired farmers, we hired growers, we hired um, biologists, we looked at, you know, hydrology and, and how water flows. We, we obviously had the landscape architects, but we also thought about material research and material building sciences. And we invited those individuals to the team. And I think the, the main lesson I learned is that the team is really crucial in delivering um, the level of buildings that you know, the living building challenge imagines for our future. So um, onto the, the project itself, I'm just gonna kind of provide some high level overviews of, of the project, kind of give you some bearings and maybe we can dive deep, deeper into some specifics as we move through this uh, dialogue. But this is the site, as you can see, the building is sited, uh, sited on the north side of the, the site and there's a large portion of the site that's dedicated to the growing of food. Um, about a third of the site um, and this is kind of an image of the a rendering of the image of the um, entry showing some biophilic design principles the resisting of the straight line the water features um, this is the interior courtyard uh, showing sort of some passive cooling heating strategies as well as some um, wastewater treatment solutions right. and this is uh, the the money shot this is the entry as you kind of curve come in and, and approach the site. Um, it's a rendering of um, the building complex as it's sited on, this, on a particular project. Um, and with that, I think I'd just like to you know, engage the rest of the um, dialogue from there. All right, thank you, Matthew. Great to hear how this is put into practice. And I would like to uh, let, um, let, us, let the audience know that um, we really would like to have your questions. We have a chat box here below the session. Feel free to put your comments, and Harry and I will uh, present them to Matthew and Amanda. So um, I would like to ask a question to Amanda. Uh, I was curious about the philosophy behind the Living Buildings Challenge. Uh, on the website, you talk about the flower being used as a metaphor, and um, I wanted to know why the flower and what's the significance behind it. Yeah, great question. So the metaphor of the flower is for us, you know, we, we envision buildings that could operate just as a flower does, that they could be pollution free, harvest all their own energy and water, be beautiful, <laughs> uh, also um, be part of an ecosystem. And, um, you know, we, we think that buildings could operate in the same way, uh, harvest their own energy and water and not pollute uh, other people in the process um, or other ecosystems in the process. So, um, you know, the metaphor of the flower is it's not just, you know, it, it looks it looks pretty. It's also that we do think that uh, buildings that are greener or more sustainable, as they've been called, um, you know, are actually beautiful because often we've seen uh, green buildings are more energy efficient. But, you know, I think if buildings are not beautiful, they they don't resonate with people, um, they don't lift our spirits, they don't connect us to nature, and uh, ultimately they won't last very long. Yeah. Is this only about beauty? The flower piece? Yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, I think it's also the metaphor of how, uh, you know, how a flower, um, you know, exists and gains its nutrients. You know, we, we envision buildings that can do a similar thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they have, we have all the resources, you know, enough sun falls on the planet in one hour to, you know, give us all the energy that we need in a year, you know. So we know we have enough energy from the sun, for example, but we typically don't use it. We think that should change for buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we think buildings should be starting to, operators, you know, more like living organisms um, and be more inspired and connected to nature and ecosystems. Right. Thank you. Great. Um, you, you talk about moving from less bad to a system that is truly regenerative, which mm -hmm. sounds very similar to um, our, our messaging here and what we talk about here um, at the foundation around the circular economy. So I'm really interested to see uh, what's the connection between between the living building challenge and the circular economy concept? And maybe maybe Matthew as well as Amanda might like to jump in on this one. 
Yeah, well, happy to start. I think there are a lot of similarities in that, yes, what we're trying to get to is closed loop, you know, ecosystems um, where, you know, we move from this current current sort of path we're on of just consuming as much as possible with no regard to how we're destructing or polluting in our in our wake. And to be able to look at it really doesn't have to be like that, right? Our buildings, our products in the circular economy can be generated in a way that is self-sustaining, that is, you know, restoring of our ecosystems. Mm -hmm. But also, I think ultimately, um, you know, we'll create better products and buildings than we have done. Um, because, you know, nature generally does things pretty well if we look to nature for inspiration. Um, and also, you know, does it in a way that doesn't destroy um, all of the resources that we have on the planet, which I think is the path we're currently on. All right, thank you. And I have a question from JP Denke. Um, he asks, should buildings last longer and be around for ages like a Victorian building or a castle or be designed to, to, to disappear, to be taken apart um, after they've been used? Um, I think either one. You know, I think uh, the Living Building Challenge encourages projects to look at disassembly and also the ability to be recycled, reused, repurposed. But we also really strongly encourage projects that are more durable. Um, you know, here in the States, it's not, it's not, you know, that typical to have a building that lasts longer than 50 years. Um, many of our living buildings are 100 year plus buildings and I hope will last for a lot longer. Um, so I think both, I think it can depend on the use and the type of project, you know, having buildings that are adaptable that could be perhaps changed or shifted or disassembled, I think is also a really great solution. Okay. Great. Um, Matthew, um, I'd like to uh, find out a little bit more about the Living Building Challenge uh, standard. If, um, if you could tell us a bit more about how that uh, works. I gather there are some quite um, important performance criteria that have to be met and that it's a very performance-based uh, model that you work towards. Sure. Um... You know, when I started reading about the Living Building Challenge, one of the things that attracted me to it was the fact that it's not such a um, prescriptive approach, um, that it's really based on performance. And so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of copying from the language that's within the Living Building Challenge, but it's really um, not just a building standard. It's, it's three things. It's um, the Living Building Challenge is a philosophy. It's a, it's a way of thinking about design. It's a way of thinking about how humans interact with nature and how the built environment can either contribute or detract from our ability to, to thrive as a species. Um, but it's also a, a, an advocacy platform. So, you know, built within the Living Building Challenge is if you can't meet the imperatives, the specific requirements, performance-based requirements of each imperative, there's a, a pathway to certification through um, advocacy. So if your local, you know, um, government won't allow you to do a certain thing with regards to water, for an example, um, it doesn't mean you can't achieve the Living Building Challenge, but it does require you to kind of get off, um, get out of your seat, get in the community, um, build consensus, advocate for change, um, and then kind of build a movement um, where these buildings are, are located so that into the future, these solutions can be adopted and you can demonstrate mm -hmm. successes um, within your particular projects. But lastly, it is that that building standard, right? And, it, and um, one of the things, like I said, I was saying earlier, what I love about it is it sets the end goal as the, um, the standard. So it, it clearly states what it wants you to achieve as a building, as a, as a, as a site, but it doesn't put in a whole lot of roadblocks or red tape yeah. by way of how to get there. So it allows project teams autonomy and um, creativity and how to arrive at these solutions. So because I think it recognizes that there's no one way to build a building responsibly. So in um, local teams, local resources, you know, they vary across the world. So it's an irresponsible in a way to say, this is the way of doing it. Um, yeah. The goals themselves are, are pretty holistic in their approach. So they, and then they all work together. So you can't achieve all 20 imperatives without addressing some really deep issues regarding the built environment. Um, and so that's really what it is. So it sets out things like net positive energy, 
um, as an example. And instead of saying you need to do X, Y, or Z to get to that, um, that goal, it simply says it's up to you how you achieve it, but you, you need to show us that you've achieved it by showing us your utility bills. So at the end of the day, you go through a performance period and it says, here's your building and here's how much energy it's producing and here, here's how much energy it's using. Mm -hmm. So um, can I can I just ask mm -hmm. if for, for any of our online uh, viewers who are thinking of creating uh, a living building of their own um, or they want to get certified, what, what are what are the steps for them in doing this? Yeah, well, well uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, the first step is to uh, download the standard. It's free. You can you can download the Living Building Challenge from our website and, and look through it, be inspired, and look through other case studies on our website and um, learn about other projects that have gone through it. And then if you decide that you want to uh, do a living building, you know, with the Institute, we actually have staff that are resources to help you through it. Um, you become registered as a project. Um, we have a sort of online conversational dialogue throughout the project. We get to know our project teams pretty well. Um, we also connect them to a community of other projects. And we're really about a movement. We have, um, you know, a movement of 30,000 or so that are either been engaged with a living building, a living community, a living product, or um, come to our events or have been, as Matthew said, starting to get engaged in their community about changing regulations or making living buildings more possible. Um, so if you're interested in doing a living building, you become part of a movement, part of a community um, that can support you through it. All right. Thank you, Amanda. I have a question for Matthew from uh, the audience, from Kima Daniels. Thank you for your question. Uh, Kim is asking, can you retrofit buildings or is it just about new buildings? You, you can, and I would even say, um, in some extent, there's trade-offs with, with synergies and with holistic approaches, but um, we, we talk a lot about energy and water because um, they're pretty easy to understand. A lot of people understand them, um, but by far the most difficult part of the living building challenge is its materials pedal. Mm -hmm. And um, what this does is it sets up um, what's appropriate ways of, of securing materials in which you build the building out of. And, you know, it identifies products that have um, chemicals that are known to be toxic to humans um, in some stage of their development, whether it's in their extraction, um, the, the manufacture, distribution, installation, um, or even after the end of life. But it, it, it sets up a pretty rigorous set of requirements um, that these materials in a new building need to apply and adhere to. Uh, but it allows some flexibility with, with existing buildings. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I usually tell people when, when they're kind of posing this questions of what, what should I do? Should I build new or retrofit? Um, the materials discussion becomes a lot more uh, I don't want to say easy because there's nothing easy about the challenge, but it, it does, there's benefits to using an adaptive reuse building um, mm -hmm. because some of the existing materials will kind of automatically comply with the, the, the materials pedal requirements. Yeah. But the trade-off is on the energy side because a lot of buildings built, you know, 100 years ago or so weren't um, thinking about the same sort of things we're thinking about from a thermal performance perspective. Um, and then also there, there, there's products on the market that had been on the market years ago that we know now are pretty pretty toxic. So there's remediation that you had to start thinking about identifying toxic, existing toxins within the building. Um, so I don't think it's it's always like in either or. Oftentimes there's just trade offs one way or the other. Um, and certainly, you know, I think it would be best just to kind of engage um, professionals in that when you're thinking about the whether or not you want to do a new building or, or renovate an existing one. And what would you say are the key yeah. challenges when you take on a project like that? Because it's a very ambitious project. You have 20 imperatives. Um, so in terms of technology or uh, co collaborating with municipalities or with the locals or to try to, uh, when it comes to local sourcing, what are, the, what are the key challenges you have experienced when building? For example, with the tribal college uh, experience. Right. Um, I mean, I think the easiest 
answer to that question is, is usually money. Like it, it, I think they have this perception that the living building challenge is, is expensive. Um, but I, I usually persist that time is really the barrier um, in the marketplace as architects. We're all really busy. Um, you know, a lot of times clients really pushing teams to kind of get into the buildings and complete the buildings ever and faster. And so I think the living building challenge does that it reframes how we approach design and it really puts um, the onus on doing design right the first time. And, and I think that time that takes a little bit of a pause in the process that we're typically used to. Um, and I've seen a lot of presentations on projects that have attempted living building challenge. And um, there's two, two primary paths that I've seen occur. One is like um, it, it the design happens over a, a course of a long span of time um, in which a lot of people are giving up their time, their professional uh, kind of pro bono work. And the other one is where you, you kind of have a really fast track project or design exercise that's kind of trying to fit into a more traditional design bid build process. In either in any other situation, I think that the, the barrier really is oftentimes just the time to execute um, the design in a way that's most appropriate to the to the project. Okay, and I have a question from uh, Richard, who is asking, it's pretty easy to get started with building, low barrier to entry and established methods to do things in the normal way. But what are your top tips, one in each, to break through the inertia in the construction industry? Um, shall I jump in on yeah, that? Yeah, feel free, Amanda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I agree just building on what Matthew said and building into this question that, you know, I think one of the biggest barriers is to building more innovatively, whether it's the living building challenge or not, um, is time, but also the will um, of people to be able to do things differently to how they have currently and to reprioritize what we focus on. You know, it's clear we have the money to build pretty elaborate buildings and buildings sometimes that have all kinds of, you know, extravagant features that cost a lot of money. Um, you know, we have usually the budgets to build buildings, but we're choosing not to spend it on uh, living buildings or buildings that are, are really, um, you know, looking at things like net positive energy or circular economy principles. So I think, um, you know, to get back to the to the question, I think, you know, one of the biggest uh, tips that I have is that, you know, we have to create a movement of people who are all engaged in this conversation. Um, and that's where I think there's great crossovers between like a circular economy community, living building community, you know, biomimicry communities, all kinds of communities that are all trying to, um, you know, tip our, our uh, society in a different direction. And, um, I think like my first tip is to is to join the movement and um, you know you're going to need a community to make this kinds of change you can't do it on your own. Great um, we've got one more question from our online audience uh, that says here is new technology uh, such as software and, and uh, modeling technologies um, are they making it easier to level up your design and architecture skills and if so how? So interesting to find out what the role of technology is in, in what you do. Matthew, do you, you know, want I, to take I, that one? <laughs> yeah, I think that's an interesting, interesting question. And, you know, at Catalyst, we obviously have invested a large amount of time and resources in trying to um, develop the right tools to kind of execute these sorts of projects. And, you know, oftentimes though, it's not a, a technological issue, I think, um, we use technology, we use energy modeling to um, demonstrate that kind of what we feel or what we found to be true in historical examples is actually still true. You know, when I was thinking about prepper, when I was preparing for this today, I was thinking about net zero buildings. And really, it's not a new construct. It's, it's a pretty ancient one, you know, and, and, and putting the idea or the kind of current building um, in perspective, air conditioning and, and electricity is a relatively new phenomenon when it, when it kind of comes to the built environment. So oftentimes we find ourselves looking to historical examples of how indigenous or ancient peoples condition their, their buildings um, 
and learning from them and then uh, applying that into kind of modern or, or contemporary projects. And I think um, what's interesting is, is while we're looking back, we also often use technology of the, the day to kind of predict what's going to happen into the future by using those technologies. And that's where we get, you know, CFD, computational fluid dynamics modeling. We get daylight analysis. We get, you know, energy modeling to help us understand how our building is going to interact with the, the kind of climate in, in the, the place that it's occupied. Um, and the, the goal here is to use those tools as early in the design process as you can to really inform um, how these buildings come together. Um, and I think that's really kind of on the bleeding edge of the market right now is, is kind of pushing, um, putting the onus on design teams to build uh, robust teams early in the design phase to execute and utilize the, the kind of emerging technologies um, to really inform design. That's really interesting. It sounds like there's a sort of a, a coming together of, of old ideas and, and new technologies, and that's, that's helping to take it to the next, the next step, the next level. Um, right. I, I'd be quite interested to, uh, to find out. You mentioned you know, taking um, learnings from indigenous peoples and um, looking back at history. What's, what's the kind of process for, for fight, you know, discovering those insights, unearthing them, and then actually incorporating them? Well, I think really, I mean, I, there's a great story in this project, this SCTC project. Um, and really it's, it's a, I think it's um, a matter of just listening to uh, native cultures that have been around a lot longer than our European ones and kind of listening to their wisdom and kind of quieting the Western ideals enough to listen to what kind of indigenous wisdom has to say. And for the SCTC project, we looked at kind of historical tribal um, structures that they've used um, that predates, you know, European settlement. And what we found was it was the wigwam. And, and with um, the tribal team, we really researched what that wigwam was doing and how it was how it was working. Um, and we found that you know it used a lot of the similar processes that we were gonna employ in the project. So I don't have it with me, but we have a pretty interesting graphic. So we have an image of a wigwam. Um, and what it is, is it's like the shelter built out of um, found um, wood products and then it's surrounded by a, a woven reed. Um, and that's put on top of a slab of compressed earth that's buried you know, with, with stones buried underneath it and um, there are reeds that connect outside air. Um, and then central to this wigwam is the fireplace. And these reeds connect and supply fresh air to the fire so that it can burn. Um, and then in winter, the, the kind of wigwam kind of adapts and encloses, fully encloses itself. And during the, the day when they're cooking it and they're using the fire, it heats the, the earth and it heats the stones underneath the earth um, so that in the evening and then when the fire goes out at night, the, the earth itself releases heat back into the, the space. Um, and then the, the shell itself of the wigwam is adaptable. So the, the reeds come down in the wintertime to protect from winds and, and the cold, but in the summertime, they kind of fold it back up and allow natural ventilation to kind of come into the space. So we looked to that as an inspiration for this, the, both the skin and how we distribute um, the heating and cooling of the facility. So we're using very similar radiant technologies, um, obviously upgraded to modern technologies, but the, the kind of genesis of the idea was the indigenous wigwam. And that's kind of how, how we, what we used as a source of inspiration to, to kind of design um, the envelope and mechanical systems into this particular project. Brilliant. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Um, we're we're going to take a, a quick pause there. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I think we're going to cut to some updates. Yes, we'll be, be giving a short update on the DIFF and what's been happening so far. Um, as, you, as many of you already know, the DIFF is a global online festival that takes place around three weeks. We have around 200 sessions where we tackle the question, can we redesign everything? Now, if you're interested in topics such as cities and urban systems, I highly recommend the session by Stefan Sekars. It's called, Can We Design Circular Roadmaps for Cities? Uh, I thought it was very enjoyable to hear. There were several experts that were brought together to the discussion to discuss the challenges and the opportunities of designing 
uh, a roadmap for cities around the world. Next, after this session at 7 p.m. GMT, we have a session with uh, Ken Webster. It's called A Flow of Wealth or A Wealth of Flows. Ken Webster is a colleague of mine here at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. He's been here since 2010. He has a background in economics education, in personal development and, uh, sorry, professional development and environmental issues. Um, he believes that the economy uh, is abundant and that it's necessary to, for it to be designed in a regenerative and accessible way. So do not miss the, uh, the session. And for a completely different topic, if you've always wondered how to grow mushrooms uh, in an international space station, do not miss our session this Thursday um, on the 16th of November. Uh, there will be students from the Australian Science and Mathematics School. They will come together and they will share the experiences on how to grow mushrooms in microgravity. And to our audience uh, online, we would love to hear from you. So please um, go to Twitter, use hashtag thinkdiff.co and let us know which sessions you have enjoyed the most. And thank you. Okay, um, thanks Suki. Uh, so uh, in a moment, uh, we'd like to get on to the kind of the big picture for, for the Living Future Institute and the challenge um, and see what your aspirations are moving forward. But before we do, um, just want to change it up a little bit and, and ask you if, if for our online viewers, if there are any would-be architects, designers um, that are watching this show and are feeling quite inspired about this, um, what, what, would, what would be your advice? How would they get involved or what kind of you know, studies or research would they kind of immerse themselves in? Yeah, how can you get started on this? So Amanda, you can... Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think there are many architecture programs. I would be selective about which architecture program you went into. You know, I went to the University of Sydney in Australia for my undergrad. And, uh, you know, we started off um, doing environmental science and studying um, patterns of weather and really had it instilled in us that, um, you know, you don't build anything until you understand the place and the climate. That's pretty unusual. So I would say I think um, prospective architecture students should really seek a program uh, that's going to enable them to understand uh, place and climate and culture as much as it is, you know, how do the physics of building a building. Um, because I think, you know, the intersection of those two is what we're going to need for architects of the future. Um, so yeah, there are, there are a few programs, uh, and I, but I would be selective about you know your education and make sure that it's broad enough to be able to come out and to um, be able to build in uh, buildings like this. Mm -hmm. That's great. It sounds like your experience at, at university and studying that it was a very systems-based perspective that incorporated a lot of understanding of natural world systems and and the interconnections between us and the built environment and, and the natural world. Um, we, is, that, uh, is that definitely a huge part of what you do, that systems thinking? Is that integral? Yeah, it is, absolutely. I think you can't build a living building or a living community without a systems thinking approach. And um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of architects are graduating uh, without that and with a very mm. sort of singular focus. Um, and I think systems thinking here yeah, is, is the core of this work. Uh, we have to be able to think holistically. We have to be able to see how one piece of a system, whether it be an ecosystem or a building system, influences the other um, or complements the other. And um, yeah, I think uh, deep, deep sort of education or uh, studying in systems thinking is pretty invaluable for architects of the future too. That's Thank you. That's good to hear. Sorry, Suki. That's uh, yeah, because uh, a big part of our our um, our work in the education programs here at the foundation is is rooted in systems thinking and and actively promoting that. So that's good to hear. Yeah. No. Yes. And I uh, just talking about the systems thinking. Uh, what I thought was really interesting about the imperatives and the performance criteria is that there's also a, quite a focus on community engagement. Um, so, for example, um, you have a performance petal called equity and uh, where you talk about social uh, justice and democracy, um, about creating uh, human skill in human places, hum humane places. How do you incorporate that? How do you quantify it? Uh, how do you in engage communities to be involved and to have that expressed in buildings? It seems quite a, a challenge to do that and quite different to what we find in other construction projects. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we we included the equity paddle in the Living Building Challenge really because we knew we needed to have these kinds of conversations. Um, you know, it's a journey for us in terms of broadening how we do that because, as you say, Suki, it's really it's really complex. Um, and you know, with one building, you may or may not have the influence or ability to really shift a community or it's um, you know the equity of that community as much as you would like. Uh, so, you know, the, the first sort of versions of our equity requirements are really focused in around what the, you know, we have a just label that's required for uh, the architecture design construction teams that, um, you know, requires them to go back to look at their own social justice framework for their company. You know, do they have equitable wages? Do they have living wages? Do they, um, you know, have uh, gender pay equity, for example? Um, you know, as the health and safety requirements at their organization, all kinds of aspects of social equity. Because we do think that, you know, if if the folks designing and um, constructing these buildings start to think about their own, um, you know, their, their own sort of treatment of the of the employees and colleagues that, you know, that can start to shift thinking a little bit. Um, but yes, we also do have requirements in there for rights to nature so that a project cannot you know, eliminate the ability for others to access waterways, for example, or public spaces um, that we can't start you know, creating spaces that are gated and not accessible for all. Um, so I would say you know, our equity paddle is really sort of touching around the edges of what you know, one building can do. Um, when we brought out the Living Community Challenge a few years ago, we felt that that has greater opportunity to really sort of influence an entire community or neighborhood by looking at sort of access to community resources, for yeah. example. And for Andrew, I have a question in terms of the tribal college. How, how are the values uh, of the tribe incorporated uh, in the building? So, sorry, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, we've lost him. Um, he might be talking. Sorry, I was I was on mute. Okay. I was, okay. Um, what's what was really interesting about this particular project is is that we looked at the Living Building Challenge, and one of the first things we did is we had kind of a um, a visioning session with as many stakeholders and shareholders as we could get together, and there was probably a room of over 30, 40 people. Um, from students to faculty to design professionals. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we try to do is come up with guiding principles of this particular um, project. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was the, the foundation ended up being um, seven um, grandfathers, and that's a, a tribal framework. Mm -hmm. um, and they identify seven kind of ways of being or, or values or virtues um, and we kind of assigned each of those seven grandfathers with a way of thinking about design and it's things like um, love respect wisdom and and how do we imbibe like the design process with these uh, human principles and values and what really happened was um, because that's such a, a a cultural culturally significant framework um, it really forced the team to think through every decision. You know, we're already attempting the highest or the most rigorous design standard in the world, which is the Living Building Challenge. And I guess we felt that like it wasn't um, difficult enough. So we added a whole different layer of, of um, tribal specific guidelines that, that the team um, had to go through. And what it ended up doing is that it kind of weeded out solutions that didn't really fit um, and allow the project team to hone in on, on, on solutions that were really integral to the tribal heritage. Um, and that's kind of where we got the wigwam from. That's kind of where a lot of the solutions came from is this, this, this idea of the seven grandfathers. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Matthew. Uh, I'd like to put a quick question to, to the both of you now. Um, dying to hear what is your favorite living building challenge or living building example. Um, and why is it your favorite? Oh, for me, I guess I already gave it away and that I showed the Tuhoi project in New Zealand, one quick slide of that in, in my slides. And um, I think it's because not only does it reach incredible environmental performance goals um, by being certified to the Living Building Challenge, but 
they really demonstrated a way that um, you know these the ancient cultures can be restored, uh, rejuvenated, and um, really I think inform uh, the way of the future for for all society. And um, I think that project exemplifies. Um, you know, all aspects of what I think of as a living future that I'd want to live in. And Matty? I'm, I'm glad I came up with two because that was mine as well. Um, <laughs> but my, my, my second is really the Omega Center for Sustainable Living. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is because it, 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 of all the projects that I'm aware of, most completely challenges existing building typologies and how we think about certain types of buildings. Mm -hmm. And so that particular project is a wastewater treatment facility. And you wouldn't think of it by looking at the pictures. And it really reimagines how infrastructure that's so crucial to human development, such as wastewater treatment, can really be framed in a more elegant solution. And so um, for me, it's one of the more hopeful solutions because it, it thinks about even kind of the ugly infrastructure that engineers kind of geek out about and makes them really beautiful and accessible and not just an eyesore that we have to clean up later um, through the lens of environmental justice, but it, it really kind of puts um, important infrastructure on the same sort of level as um, some of the more beautiful buildings that we surround ourselves with. So. All right, thank you, uh, Matthew. I have a, a last question, uh, and this is for Amanda. Uh, I wanted to go back to your presentation where you uh, described the goal of the Living Building uh, uh, Challenge in the Living Future Institute. And so just to recap, the goal was, um, it said, our goal is simple, in the words of Buckminster Fuller, to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. And my question is, is it really that simple? And can we really make a world that works for 100% of humanity? And um, how can we achieve such a vision, such a bold and ambitious vision? Yeah, well, I think it has to be possible. <laughs> and uh, is it going to be easy? No, no, for sure not. Um, but uh, I think there are enough of us that uh, have a similar vision that are working together uh, to to make this re a reality. Um, but, uh, you know, essentially we're often fighting more against sort of human will and um, social change than anything. Mm -hmm. And change can be slower than we would like. Um, but I think ultimately for us, if you portray a really hopeful, inspirational vision of what the future can look like, I think change can happen more rapidly. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, I'm trying to look if there's some interesting comments from the audience. I can maybe, I have one from Daniel Hargan. Do standards put a threshold or constraint on innovation? Maybe that's a nice one for Matthew and then we will have to close uh, the discussion. I, I would say it's the opposite. I would say this particular living building challenge, because it's performance based, really opens up the doors for true innovation. Um, I think oftentimes we, we, you know, we, we know what we kind of need to do and it's just really how to get there. That's really the barrier. Um, and what I love about the Living Building Challenge is that it, it really kind of breaks down those barriers and encourages project teams to truly be innovative mm -hmm. and come up with solutions that maybe they, the Living Building Future Institute wasn't even thinking about when they wrote the standard. Um, so far from it, I think, if anything, the standard, um, lays the groundwork for, for true collaboration and true innovation in the in architectural marketplace. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Matthew and Amanda, for joining us for this very interesting discussion and sharing your work. Um, it's really, really inspiring to, to hear about a future that is, that is regenerative and positive and that we have people like you guys working on this. So thank you. And um, to... Anybody else watching, uh, that's the end of this session, but there is plenty more coming up. Um, you can find more about our speakers um, on this session page. You can read their biographies and you can uh, engage with the diff. There's lots more to come and you can join in the conversation at hashtag thinkdiff. Uh, I'm Harry and this is Suki and thank you very much to our guests. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.